Hello, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Get Out There podcast. My name is Billy Newman. I'm here with Robert Biscarat. How are you doing, Robert? Hey, Billy. I'm doing well. How about you? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for calling in, doing uh, episode five. We got, uh, we got the feed started. We got a, a couple episodes up. It's kind of fun. Thanks for doing a podcast. Yeah, yeah we're moving right along. <laughs> we're, getting, we're getting a couple <laughs> in for, uh, for the little bit of time that we've been doing it. But um, So we finished up our conversation in episode four, we were talking about some of our experiences backpacking. Like uh, I was talking yeah. about the Wallows, you were talking about that King Range trip that you had. And I know at the end of it, we talked, we just kind of come up to that idea where we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the equipment that we brought with us or like some mm-hmm. of the breakdown that we had of the gear that we would bring when we were backpacking or when we were doing other stuff. I wanted to break that, that idea down with you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty important. It can make or break a trip, kind of depending on what you have or don't have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, uh, I've definitely uh, mispacked before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, it's... oh, go ahead, Robert. Oh, I was just going to, I was just going to say, um, do, you, do you tend to overpack or underpack? Oh, let's see. I think, uh, well, so I guess if going for backpacking, originally I was overpacked. Now it's probably still yeah. overpacked, but I've gotten it. I've gotten it pretty tight. When I'm in shape for it, I do an okay job. But what I noticed though is when you like you accidentally or you just mishap and don't bring something that you really needed. Like um, the one yeah. that's always been for me is like a sleeping pad or something like that. Like where oh. it's like that thing where it goes from like it's like thirty percent less of a comfortable trip just because of that one thing that you don't have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you, it weighs so little yeah you have you have everything else in association with it but you don't have that one piece that i think that's happened a couple times before like i don't know it's probably happened with like my stove or with food or something like that like we talked about tabasco on our last trip yeah like, oh, yeah. if only had that that just one ingredient this would be rad but, see i i'm i'm uh the opposite i always tend to overpack i like i I go overkill. I just start getting into that mindset of like, well, okay, well, what if I had to make a splint? Well, okay, well, I need rope. Okay, uh, what if I had to do this? And I just get into all these, you know, hypotheticals, and then I end oh, up yeah. packing for every situation I could think of. I've packed for way too many hypotheticals. Yeah, but you know what's <laughs> funny is uh, you do all that planning, and then the one thing that would happen would be the only thing you didn't compensate you for. Uh, then... yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's really true. Sometimes that's a, that's a weird part of the compensation about the outdoors. You get like, you can plan for a lot of hypotheticals and I want to break this down with you too later, probably, but like the idea of like equipment that you bring versus risk, like how likely is that risk to happen that you need the equipment? There's probably some different experiences we've had around that, but it's just kind of like a weird idea of how much, how much effort goes into preventing certain types of things. When mm-hmm. maybe like a lot of that stuff can be handled with like a Leatherman, I guess, if you think, or like uh, or yeah, some uh, some Swiss Army knife. Yeah, exactly. Or but like some level of good base gear. It seems like that's the thing that I've gotten the most comfortable about in the last, I don't know, couple times of backpacking or like the longer uh, times that we've done backpacking when you get like a little bit more focused in on just the few things that you need to do for that five day period that you're going to be there. Cause that's a really, that's the big thing. And, and the, it's weird how you notice this, the longer that you go out, the less you, you finally realize the less you need to bring at all. Like if you're going oh. for 80 days, you almost need to bring nothing. But if you're going for three days, you seem like in your mind, you need to bring everything. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's funny. You bring that up. Cause that's exactly how that works too. It's isn't just that, like, isn't I, I don't, I don't know if it's like the the complex of like you just can't you just can't really foresee eighty days in the future, so you just you kind of give up. You're like, well, I can't even plan for this, you know. Right. So yeah. I'll just bring my minimalist stuff. Or and we're in three days. You're kind of thinking like, well, this might happen. This might happen. Uh, day three. Okay, this. I'll need this. Yeah, you're trying and to then, navigate every corner and every maneuver of this future map of of circumstances that you might run into. And, it's and just, then you yeah you can't. Yeah, you, you you do the thing where like uh you know you're going for three days also, and you're like, well, wow, I have so much room, you know, I only <laughs> have three days worth of stuff, which is pretty minimalist, and then you end up going, oh well, I got room for this and this, and then snacks before you before you know it, yeah, you're just packed up, man. <laughs> let's put a six pack in the top, yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it, that's happened a couple of times. 
I was trying to think about how that worked out for me. I remember early on when I did uh, when I did like a couple early backpacking trips. We talked about this in that first episode. I think doing some stuff on the lower rogue, maybe the yeah. second one. Where um, yeah, that first trip I I did uh, the the forty whatever miles down the lower rogue, and it was just way rushed and it was way too heavy and all the stuff. You like we brought a bunch of cans, but we didn't have a can opener. And like, yeah, like, <laughs> like, what, like, what was this? What was the system that was going behind this? Like, you, you know, you you get things that work in a kitchen, but there's no system behind that that helps you, you know, do that in the backcountry, I guess, if it, or you know, keep things uh, good or like purify enough water to have. Uh huh. I like that's always that was always one having enough so, water with you. So that's something I want to ask you. What kind of uh, what kind of water purification? I have always been. Sure under under tech about this like i really wanted more equipment for water purification it's probably uh, been uh well you know i've been fortunate a lot of the time but yeah it's it's been risky maybe one or two times but i've only ever had this squeeze bottle charcoal filter like you fill it up with maybe 12 ounces uh, of water and yeah. you squeeze it out of this filter what we would do marina and i when we go backpacking we were up in the Wallawas, we were up in the Trinity Alps, we were up in the Tetons. It was a lot of spots where it was like really clean snow melt. So it worked out uh -huh. in our favor a lot of times. On the other hand, there was times where we were on the lower rogue in the canyon and there's really no good, you know, it was mosquito puddles. That you're, well, <laughs> God. <laughs> or whatever it well, is. That's that's where I caught Jardia. Not uh, drinking out of a mosquito puddle, but yikes. yeah, that was that was nasty. And that was my filter broke. And that was the biggest thing I learned was, uh, I don't know, you always hear uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, Ooh, yeah. Like it's, ah, man, just maintaining your equipment, cleaning it after every trip, uh, doing, just doing the basic maintenance that your equipment requires. See, that's, <laughs> that's something I've not understood for a long time. And I, yeah, the, the system that we had for water was super basic. Like we just, we'd fill up the 12 ounces we put the top on and we'd like squeeze it. You have to like kind of crush it through the charcoal filter to get it to to And those cleanse. those move slow too. Way slow. And so you yeah. crush it out. So we'd have like our Nalgene bottle like between our knees and our hands just kind of like crushing down on this creek water that we were trying to put <laughs> that we were trying to put in our Nalgene. We had like three or four of them that we had to sit at the creek at to pump out, you know, I don't know, two or three liters of water to take back to camp with us or to go hiking with for the next uh, rest of the day. So I use that. I use just that one filter for like three uh -huh. years. Um, okay. <laughs> like way too, way too many gallons of water, I think, for that. Until the charcoal just finally broke off. Or, you know, like the whole filter unit just finally broke off. I figured, oh, yeah, it's probably... It's probably did that, happen? Did that break time. off on a trip? It did, yeah. Yeah, that's when they always do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it was. I know we were on a trip and we realized we really couldn't get water. So that was... <laughs> That was a tough one. I think <laughs> I think that was up in the Trinity Alps. That was, um, yeah, that was in uh, like Northern California, and it, it, I, we were fortunate enough that we just didn't get sick. But uh, it was like it was snow, you know, it was, it was super super cold, super crisp water, like right up at, above the tree line. So it was, yeah, when you're up above pure. the tree line, you're usually pretty safe. I mean, you're gonna, your chances of having an animal defecate or die in the creek or something is pretty minimal. Yeah, but. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I know, like Crazy. when we were in Kings Canyon, there were a ton of places where, I mean, after the Giardia incident, it was kind of like, you know, I'm not taking any chances, but sure. at the same time, you know, if, if it was ever, if I were ever in the situation where I needed to take the risk, uh, I couldn't really picture a better place to take it. Oh yeah. You know? Somewhere like that. Well, do you, do you carry like iodine tablets with you? Had you no. done that for water purification ever? No, I haven't. I've heard they've kind of got a funky taste. I don't know. I've heard that um, they do too, but I guess I've heard like, uh, well, I think maybe this <laughs> this situation like we're talking about is, I guess have that maybe around for your your backup water supply. I no, don't know. no. Would you not do it? Yeah. I just nope. Jardy all the way, man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, so what what was the water filter that you picked or pick now as um, one you use? Because I need I to buy one. I can't remember the specific name of it, but it's a Catadin, or um. And I but love it, man. It's like it's like two two liters a minute. So it's actually wow. a pretty, yeah, it's super efficient. And uh, but it's got like a filtered end on a hose, and then it's basically got like a, a hand lever, like you would see the old the well pumps uh, back at like the turn of the century, how people would pump yeah. out of the groundwater. Sure, that makes sense. Um, the same same basic setup, and then it runs through a filter 
it has like a sediment trap that'll catch any large sediment coming in. Okay. And then it goes up through like a carbon disc. And then it comes down through a charcoal fi- filtration system and then back through an actual, um, like, I don't know, some kind of cloth filter. So it has three three variants of filtration before it actually gets through to your to your, to your bottle, bottle or, or whatever yeah, you're your putting bo- it yeah. into. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Has it worked so, out pretty well for you? Like, did you use that downriver a lot? Or did you guys have other systems on the boat when you're doing guide um, stuff? Uh, you know what? Uh, we carry all of our own water on the boat. Like uh, before we leave, we'll we'll pe- load up, you know, five or six uh, five gallon cans of water. Yeah. Okay. I would so, figure that makes sense. So we just sense. bring all that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when you're running commercial stuff like that, it's just. I mean, any type of risk you can mitigate. Yeah, uh, I figured you wouldn't you use know. it for the commercial stuff, but uh, well, I was wondering for you or like um, if you had like if you'd put it through a lot of repetitions of of its pace, you know. Uh, or what I guess what I was wondering is like how long does it last? How, what's the kind of maintenance that you ran into with the issues you had with your okay, last one? Okay, so so what I didn't do, um, is they they have new gaskets that come with it. Okay, um, yeah. They have new carbon discs. They have a uh, new charcoal that you put in there. Um, you need to keep the gaskets lubricated so that way when you let it sit for a year and a half before your next trip, you don't pull it out and those gaskets are cracked. Oh really? And uh. That I just kind of had, you know, the hellstorm of all three of those things where it was just like my sixth trip that I'd used it um, over the period of like three and a half years. Sure. Yeah. And I just, yeah, I just didn't maintain it and uh, ultimately ended up kind of paying for that. Oh, man. That's so sad. That's tough. I'm... Well, you know, lesson learned, though. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I get that. Yeah. I remember there was yeah. uh, there was one trip that we did. See, this is the nutty thing is that uh, like when in Oregon, it's great because you have this luxury of just being able to carry a water filter with you and have this assurance that you're going to run into consistent water supply for your whole yeah. backpacking trip through the wilderness. We have a lot of creeks and stuff. A lot of the places maybe you and I'll probably go are in like mountain areas where like we were talking about, like going up into an alpine lake or something like that. There's normally a creek feeding off of that or some kind of snow melt that's sort of yeah. consistent through that draw. And you're going to be able to pull water from that for the for the time that you're there. But what was tricky is is when we were out further east. Uh, I think we were out in Utah. We went to Capitol Reef and we did a backpacking trip there. And it was yeah. it's tricky because out there, when you get into Utah or probably anywhere in the southwest region there, you have to bring all of the water with you on a backpacking trip. So it's just part of the weight you pack. Uh-huh. It's pretty nuts. And it, I think it's like a ratio of about two gallons per person per day. Which seems, you know, rel- reasonable, really. But if you're doing just a couple days, that means like each person is carrying another eight pounds or like you know eight gallons of water on well, them, which is a ton. Well, yeah, weight. which is sixty-four pounds of water. It was. I remember we did we did Capital Reef. We had, I think, four gallons. So I think Marina uh-huh. and I both had two gallons. Maybe I think I might have had more. But she probably, she, she carried a lot of gallons of water and we carried all this water up there and it was a lot. It was ridiculous. But yeah, it was probably another 30 pounds each. Yeah, no, I believe it. I mean, water's super heavy and it takes up a lot of space. Oh, it takes up so much space. Yeah. There's a picture of me just kind of strapped in gallon jugs. We didn't even have like a system of care. Like we don't have like even a camel pack. That's like, you know, two liters or so that's ounces. Yeah. You're going to break that in an hour. Yeah. So, so yeah, you have that full that's on your chest. Then you have like three just gallon bottles of water, like kind of strapped around your back. Did you, did you have like a, like a pole strapped across your shoulders with (laughs) with buckets (laughs) of water? Yeah. The big bucket on the side. (laughs) I put over the top of my head as I hike around. I, you know, out there, that's like the environment that it seems like you'd need it. But it was strange because there, I think there were a couple water sources around, but they had dried up by that time in the year. You know, they're seasonal. I think they're like in that area of the desert. And it's it's really remote out there when you get out to Capitol Reef because there's no big town near there, really. Uh huh. You know what I mean? I mean, even I guess Death Valley is kind of the same way, but but Las Vegas is sort of close to it. Uh, but out, about out in Capitol Reef, man, there was nothing out there. And it was just super dry and it yeah. was super, it was super caustic to your, your being, man. What, if you what, were out there. What time of, uh, what time of year were you out there? We were there in October and it was, okay, so and it was, it was still pretty hot. 
it was yeah. it was still like oh man like in the day this is kind of hard to do but we did i think like uh, a handful of miles in to this arch that was back there that we wanted to camp by and we we had a couple days out there it was cool it was really remote it was interesting to see uh some of that landscape out there but man there was no water to be found it was just high desert like there was like a mud pit that was maybe four or five miles further you know that that was like the saving grace back in the 1800s when you're a frontiersman in that area imagine oh. that with no gear no water filter <laughs> <laughs> No, uh, yeah, like you're, you're, you're out of water for a while, but there's a chance that there's this muddy pit that's like a natural spring a few miles up this way, and you might be able to get enough water to survive to your next drop off. I don't know, down oh, in elevation. Oh, the good old down days. The Man, the good old days. Oh, that would have been terrible. Yeah. Yeah, you think about what the frontiersmen would have had to have, or just get through to get through dealing with water filter, or... I mean, obviously, they're not filtering their water, but just dealing with the water sources that they have to encounter. Yeah, I, I don't even want to think about that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> I think oh, that man. they'd argue that we're probably living in the good old days. <laughs> not yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's probably true. Um, but yeah, I don't think I've had like a big problem with the water filter before. We've done what well, we because we'd always like have it so that we just have like a big store of water on us while we were while we were moving, and then. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to ask you about like um, if we were moving on from from what we were talking about. I wanted to talk to you about like the stoves that you that you would bring. Have you yeah. brought like a stove with you much backpacking, or or do you try like not? Well, yeah, because you do uh, just the jet boil food all the time, right? Yeah, so that's that's my primary is my jet boil. I mean, you can really do just about anything in there. Um, Man, yeah, it's great. I mean, there there and there's so many different ways to use it, like. One thing you can do is just, I mean, if you have time, I mean, YouTube is such a vast information center. You can go in there and just look stuff up and just like ways to be creative with a jet boil. I mean, they have, they have instructions oh, really? on, on how to, how to bake in your jet boil. Oh, right? for real? You can, you can bake a mountain cake while you're up there. I didn't but, know that. I'd burned, I burned a lot of stuff in that jet boil. <laughs> well, cause it just like, it just goes to like hot right away. There's, I don't even, I don't know how you bake in it. <laughs> But that's really cool. Yeah, it, it 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 honestly it seemed like more hassle than it was worth. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I yeah, have bring a slice it, of but cake. But I mean, but it is possible. Um, that's cool. So other than that, I've just got this like this cheap little uh, what is that? It's like the isobutane. Is that what we run those I, canisters? Yeah. I remember. I think that. that's what it is. I remember that little um, stove. That's a cool one. That's a good backup stove. Yeah, and it's just like a, you know, I think I paid like 30 bucks for it, man. The thing's tiny. Like, it's just a little backpacking stove, sure. and it's awesome. Sure. I think those are really useful. You know, we did we did like our 50-day our trip. We did that with just the jet boil, and we did as uh -huh. much as we could with that, that second uh, trip that we did for like 100 and, 110 days or whatever it was. Yeah. We did that with the jet boil. We had to buy like a, a propane stove, like just a, a single kind of the same idea as a jet boil or a backpacker stove where it's just yeah. the burner that fits on top of the on top of the tank. We had to buy one yeah. of those halfway through the trip and it was nuts because like we just worn out the jet boil. It was nuts because like so um I guess So if, when you use one for 110 days straight, they they have a hard time. Yeah, if you unscrew it, <laughs> screw it back together, but we we still cobbled it together to work cuz we like we needed to boil water. I remember it was out on the yeah. Oregon coast. I think it was a, a spot that we had taken you to after that um was it like Sisters Rock area? Oh, yeah. Do you remember yeah, when we were there? there? That was really cool. Yeah. That was a cool spot. It was fun. To, and so we were there the year before I took you guys there. And uh, we had camped there for better half of a week or so. And we were using mm -hmm. the, the jet bowl to, you know, make coffee and do everything with it. But the, the stove part, the threading that goes down where it would connect to the gas canister had like started to wear out. So it would pop. It would blow the, the stove off of the tank. Like the threading would fail, oh. it would just it would just pull apart, and so it was like it, it was leaking, and you couldn't get it to seal tight enough, so that you could you could get a connection from the stove to the tank to draw the fuel so, out to burn. So that brings me to uh, something I I want to bring up on this. Yeah, is a big thing that I factor in when I'm packing is materials to fix stuff. Oh yeah, um, like that's huge. I mean, like one thing that was good to have in your pack is that. Uh, um, it's it's like the plumber's tape. Um, it's like a yeah. thin nylon that you wrap around threading to 
to make a gasket essentially. Um, they make it for for gas, so like propane and stuff. Um, it costs you like a buck twenty nine at you know your local plumbing store, or Home Depot or something. And uh, and that's great to have in your pack for exactly that situation because those threads are like a thin aluminum, you know. Yeah. I mean, they're not meant to be taken apart and put back together thousands of times. Yeah, I've torqued so, it a lot. In a situation like that, I mean, that gives you, you know, it's gonna create a seal and you could probably you know milk it for another month or two doing that <laughs> yeah so that's that's exactly what we did in the moment when we were out there is um is uh, we took uh we took the electrical tape that was in the glove box and oh, we, yeah. we cut like a slip of that just like and we had to do this like all the time we so we, we'd set it up on a new canister <laughs> and then we would not break it down we wouldn't touch it until that canister was finally finished but we used it for the <laughs> for the for almost the rest of it like the the part on at Sisters Rock on the coast that was like day fifteen of a hundred. So we used it. The, oh whoa! <laughs> we used it the rest of the time. We had a we had to kind of supplement it with some other thing. Uh, yeah. But uh, but yeah, we just we had to put put a little bit of um, of electrical tape around the threading and then and then try and like gently work it together so that it would hold enough so that we could boil our water and cook our food. But we did that a lot of times, man. We ran through like another half dozen canisters of fuel. Before we finally probably retired that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's great, man. I mean, that's that's what it's about. That's what's cool is like being on those long trips, or you know, even just a trip where you're away from things. Like it, it, it forces you to be resourceful and kind of. Oh man, I love that. Figure part. out what you can do with what you have. Oh uh, yeah, our tent broke. Our tent pole broke at one point. It was oh. in the wind. Our tent was set up. It was weighted down. The wind came in while we were hiking, and it it crushed that tent, man. It like it just torqued that thing over, and it, it snapped one of the poles. It snapped the one that was kind of under the the heavier tension load. There's a few that were. It was an interesting tent design, but there's there's like you know one that was like it didn't matter. There's the other one that was mm -hmm. like torqued around 180 degrees. It was almost like both points were almost touching each other. And that thing just like crushed as the tent rolled over on its side. And we were like, well, shoot. And it was kind of a weird tent. We couldn't really get a replacement pole in that length and that size. And so we had to like yeah. figure out a way. I think what happened is if you would imagine, you know, that the, there's the aluminum piece and then there's the peg of the next aluminum pole as it comes together with, you know, yeah. the tent pole. It has like the collar. Yeah, yeah. That collar. What had happened is that, is that the, it just broke out of that, like whatever piece inserted into the piece next to it, it just snapped oh. out. It kind of like broke out that, uh, that first top inch of the piece of aluminum. And so we went over to this can that we had, it wasn't like a Coke can. I think it was just like some tin can that we'd had chili in, something, something uh -huh. like that, or some canned tomato. And so we like clipped that down and had to roll that with a pencil to get like a little tube. And we like yeah. rolled that around the broken part to be a splint for our tent pole so we could keep our yeah. tent together on a camping trip. But we, we still, I mean, the tent still like that. We use that tent for like another, I think like we we're saying in there, like six or seven months. Way too many trips. <laughs> God, that's awesome, man. What was that like being out there on the road? For on the what? 115 days. Oh, uh, man, it was so cool. Well, that, that comes back around to what we were talking about a little bit at the beginning when we were saying it's nuts when you think about what you need to bring for three days versus what yeah. you need to bring for, in this case, like 100 days. My thinking about it was not very clear. I was only thinking about like the first week. It was really just bring everything. Bring everything, have it in your car be loaded down. I even did this the year before in the car and I thought I like knew better, but, <laughs> and I did know better. I cut down a lot of stuff. It was a lot easier the second time around, but you really notice that almost everything you can leave home in a big way. As long as you have yeah. your, yourself and, and some level of resources around you, you can probably mm -hmm. get through or, you know, like survive most days and get to the next one in, in a significant amount of comfort. You know, if you don't put yourself through hell, I suppose. But it worked yeah. out. It worked out really well a lot of the time. Like for it was strange because I, I guess what I would say is after maybe the first two weeks, first three weeks, I'd say after fifteen days, your body acclimates to to what it's doing in a in a kind of weird way. I don't know if you had this yeah. like firefighting, or uh, or if you've had it in like some other situation, but it seems like after maybe some number of days, it seems like you just get a little less dirty every day, or you're you sleep Man. a little better at night when you thought yeah. there was no way you could sleep that well. Exactly. 
But that's what happens, man. It's like your body just acclimates. To that. And, and actually, I was talking about that with my dad yesterday. We were talking about how, you know, uh, where we live, it's pretty quiet. So, like, um, we go and stay somewhere, like, in the in the center of, like, a city or something. And you can hear people talking. And you've got street lamps on. Totally. And you'll you'll lay wide awake for the first two nights. But then on by night three, you know. It's like you just get used to the background noise and stuff and you just tune it out and you're just falling asleep. But it's the same thing with being on the road or being up in the hills. It's like, uh, you know, you, you get past that initial, oh, I'm dirty feeling. And then that's just the way you are. You no, know? it's or really true. You just, you adapt to what you're doing. And there's, there's physical things th- too that happen. Like I swear that, I mean, maybe like a suntan is a good example of it. When, you're, uh-huh. when you have no exposure and then you're put under exposure. A mm-hmm. lot more than you're used to, you get burned. It's sort of what happens. So, like, um, if you but if you build up a tolerance to it, if you build up a tan, then you you don't get burned. You don't get that uh, caustic effect from the exposure of the sun. Sort of the same exactly. way of, of camping or of being out in the wilderness for a handful of days. Is it seems like you got a little bit a little bit better at it. Like I remember, I mean, probably similar to a sunburn, but man, my lips would chap like crazy as soon as I got over into a different type of climate. Or I guess you know, just, just a drier atmosphere or something like that. But yeah, as soon as you go east of the Cascades, man, my lips would chap immediately. Or if you went up an elevation, like up uh, into like an alpine area, oh, it was terrible. Yeah. But then after, I don't know, what, one week, two weeks or something like that, it just wouldn't happen again. And then just really? that, that thing, yeah, where you get, or like I, the thing that I remember the most, this is maybe more of just an awareness piece. I don't know if this uh-huh. has happened to you, but I remember I would get cut a lot when I first went camping. Or even yeah. like now, like at the beginning of the season, if I went out, I'd probably like get, I don't know, some kind of weird, some number of nicks from circumstances I was putting myself in with a pocket knife or with wood or with, I don't know, something I had to do, but my hands would get cut up more. And then after a pretty short amount of time, I didn't run into any more injuries like that. Just those circumstantial in- injuries, the small like little yeah. abrasions that you get into. It's, it just well, stopped happening. And that's, that's funny. It's the same thing like... uh so I work in carpentry and I can, I can count probably 27 cuts between the two of my hands that like, they're just little, I mean, a couple of them, you know, are there, you know, Oh yeah. you keep hitting them or it hurt when you got them, but it's just like, they're everywhere. And you come home at night and you look at your hands and go, what? Where did right? that come from? <laughs> or like, or you're like, Oh, that's a pretty open wound. I didn't know about that. You know, and it's just, <laughs> you, your body just stops interpreting that as like a distress signal and it's like oh this is the norm this is just what happens yeah and uh it's kind of like with scent you know how uh like a, a new smell will be really overpowering but like sure or so you go to the landfill right and then you spend right. awesome. an hour there and you can't smell it yeah and so what that that is and i'm sure you know but it's a it's your body's defense you know it it detects new scents and makes them strong so you're aware of them but once your body figures out that it's not a threat to you and your livelihood, then it dissipates and just becomes, you know, a subconscious scent that you're not actively smelling. Yeah, I totally get that. I've heard that before yeah. about like, yeah, different scents and stuff that come through. It's weird. Yeah, it's probably it's probably an effect that's really similar to that with the stuff about <laughs> about cutting. But but man, I remember it was so weird because we we were just in the Camry at the time, this old '92 Camry, and like we would notice that we really just wanted to get rid of most of the weight of the things that were in the car. We only needed a backpack or two backpacks, you know, it was, I don't know. It was just nuts when you figure out like, Oh man, none of this stuff is really like what we need to get at. We really only do these two or three or four things. And we do those pretty repetitively and you Mm -hmm. don't need the rest of the stuff. Yeah, no, you don't. And that's, that's what I, I always enjoy that. Like when, by the time you get done with a backpacking trip or, a road trip or something it it really makes you realize how little you need to actually function in your day-to-day life yeah Um, absolutely and just and just how much excess stuff you just carry around for no reason you know you come (laughs) off a trip like that and you're thinking to yourself uh you know oh i lived with nothing but a toothbrush and just like uh you know a water bottle pocket you are yeah exactly (laughs) yeah and then you come home and you're like, wow, what do I have all this stuff for? No, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, what it's, does this do? <laughs> it's definitely happened. I wanted to ask you about like the downriver stuff that you did on the Rogue when okay. you were when you were like, what, I don't know, three or four day trips. 
yeah. like what that was like and or like so how much gear do you guys carry down i mean there's there's for the guests and stuff but kind of cutting that out a bit like for yourself how much gear would you think that is per person maybe so much <laughs> um okay so so us as guides pack i don't want to say minimally but we pack the the necessities while staying comfortable Absolutely, you know yeah. it's like you don't want to uh to underpack because we live down there you know 90 to 100 days out of the year so it's like you start um you know really trying to figure out what you enjoy like good sleeping equipment nobody nobody goes light on that everybody brings great sleeping equipment what's the best sleeping um, equipment to bring for the lower rug down there man i've got what's called a roller cot um it's like a nylon material that uh is it, it's like a rubberized i don't even know how to explain it but um uh, it's like I, a mesh material. i saw Water that of yours of and i really yeah. want that that looked cool it's great they're super durable um i mean they're really strong um they're waterproof uh you know i couldn't ask for anything better and they roll up to like the you know the length of your arm and um everything's lightweight and aluminum it's just a good cot um but anyway that's called a roller cot but yeah we take that i take a sleeping pad to kind of create a barrier between uh the air beneath me and and my sure. sleeping bag yeah um yeah you bring yourself a nice pillow a sleeping bag and you're good to go Man, that it looks like a really good setup. I like that that cot system that you had, and it sets up in like almost no time at all. Yeah, you can have it put together in a matter of, you know, in less than a minute. And it seems super durable nice. too. Like it's not really going to be affected by being weathered over a couple of seasons. Well, yeah, you get like fabric cots and stuff like that, and they'll, you know, just between the sun and the water and whatever else, what other elements are getting to them, they'll just kind of rip and tear eventually yeah um, but no when we go on those trips um we the guides for the company pack a pretty hefty setup you know sure. we bring in um we bring a full kitchen so we've got four you know stand-up stoves we've got tables and pots and pans and jugs of water and coolers and you know i mean it's really it's really a a big operation that we do yeah sure. um and then, you know, the guests bring whatever they think they need to be comfortable with um, over the course of three or four days. And like we were talking about, um, when we can potentially overpack on a backpacking trip, um, people can really overpack when they're not carrying their own bag around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're oh, like, yeah. and you get a lot of people, too, that are from, you know, really urban settings and getting down there in the canyon is kind of really outside their comfort zone. And totally. I, I understand. They've that. just got so much stuff. Uh, and, uh, yeah but that's why they hire a gear boater right <laughs> yeah i figure that's true that's cool so um so like probably a good amount of equipment what if you and i just went on a trip and we had to haul out to a to a different river that was a little further away so we were kind of trying to cut down a little bit like what kind of equipment would you bring on sort of a lightweight single boat trip uh, down a river I guess a lot of that would depend on what the fishability of the river was if oh, we could sure, get away yeah. with potentially eating fish um i would cut down on food a good deal it depends on just how comfortable you want to be i mean if you're if you're interested in just having kind of a you know a back to the basics really kind of fend for yourself experience you can go really light i mean you could go backpacking light with just a little isobutane stove oh and, that'd be cool I'd want to do that I, with I really you want to do a summer. trip like that. We should. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've thought about that a lot. I really want to do one of those, and I want to do, like, a, a high desert trip like that, too. too. Oh, yeah. 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 A high God. desert rafting trip? No. A high camping. desert camping trip that was, like, yeah. backpacking like that? Kind of alpine? Cottontails and, and streams, man. Oh, man. Yeah, like, hunt, hunt and fish for all the food that you have. Or have like yeah. a couple backpacking meals or something. <laughs> Man, that's <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, you obviously bring a backup, but yeah, that would be the idea. That's a cool idea. Yeah. Well, I like the idea of doing it on the on the river though. I thought that would be kind of fun or have it set up kind of like a like a, a, a backpacking trip with a raft. I was wondering how self sustaining could you be from a raft on a raft trip? Like um like how many days do you think you could do 
a raft trip well, for? Well, I just had uh, some friends that went down to Colorado, and they just did uh, 33 days. 33 days. But they run yeah. into stores, right? Or do, do they have anything like that? Like, it's it's probably um, true plan that they... I, I, From what I understand, they packed everything, because... Oh, wow. If you're not familiar with river guide culture, um, everyone's pretty poor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not like... Uh, got a ton of money to spend at places so um i mean really it's like you kind of go on the cheap but i mean you bring the biggest hang up is what you need to keep cold like if you need to put stuff on ice and things like that yeah um, but if you can cut that stuff back you can really be very self-sustaining yeah yeah, yeah. i figure that was what we noticed at, uh car traveling too is man like having a having the cooler <sighs> was a constant liability where we just had oh, to keep absolutely. feeding it ice always losing yeah, and we're always losing energy. Like it's always it's always going out. We're spending a, a hand like probably a good bit just on ice traveling around. And we finally figured out like one of the things we were talking about earlier, what you think uh, at the beginning versus what you think at the end. Man, cutting down on a cooler or cutting down on ice and and things that you have to keep cold constantly. That was the the biggest improvement of the 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 maintenance that we had to do for our our like our trip travel yeah. setup stuff. It was it was so frustrating to try and like always keep that and like you're always throwing away stuff that's gone rotten in some way exactly and then also when you're in a car you know the heat inside the car generally is amplified when you're in the oh sun. yeah oh yeah <clears throat> but the big thing on like if you're packing a cold cooler whether it's rafting or camping or whatever it is keep it shut as much as possible you know every time sure. you open it you're gonna lose it's gonna heat up in there so i mean just keep it shut um, a lot of times you can duct tape the seal um, oh, so cool, you don't man. lose any any cold air from there um, and do that and you can really keep food cold for a long time or just go to the store if you know you're going to be gone for 10 days get a couple blocks of dry ice and put those into a cooler that is um, just a cooler for your ice and then you keep that in there you keep that wrapped with duct tape and you only open it when you need to swap it into the cold cooler that's a smart so idea you can really, yeah yeah you know so you've got an ice box and then a cooler essentially oh okay i like that i like that thinking that's kind of that's kind of interesting you know we we finally invested in a in a yeti cooler like one of those thicker uh lined coolers with like the rubber straps that come down so it like clamps itself down the lid yeah how do do you how do you feel about that they don't they don't sponsor us so i can yeah (laughs) talk talk i can speak my mind uh, I think that they are. I think that they are too expensive. I think that they do keep ice well, and it is. Uh-huh. It's like one of the better, better ways I've seen of a cooler. What do you? What's your experience with them? Well, I I have little experience with them, but I I don't know. I mean, it just seems like, like I mean, yeah, they hold ice really well. And if I was buying it for the only reason is to keep ice cold, sure. Then then I could validate that. But it just seems like you're paying you know like 75 bucks on a cooler that its interior area would hold a six pack of beer maybe like oh yeah a block oh, of yeah. ice that uh that you know? 20 quart one that we have is small yeah if you, i think that the concept behind it right not to use of ice is that mm-hmm. you okay so first you have your cooler of course just in the back of your uh-huh. truck you get a bag of ice you put the bag of ice in the cooler you shake it around you leave it there for a half hour just to chill the cooler just because yeah. ch- it's too hot inside, right? Then yeah. you dump that bag of ice completely. That's gone. Then you put <laughs> then you put three bags of like cold ice in there. I think there's like cold or what is it like? There's wet ice. Have you heard of that? Like when yeah. it's like around like what thirty two or something? It's like kind of like yeah. running into liquid. That's what you get at every convenience store because they mm-hmm. you know they just turn up their their freezers to like as high as they can. Yeah. <laughs> But then, yeah, so you throw in another three bags of ice, like almost, it's like three quarters full at that point. And then you can put in what you're talking about, maybe a six pack of beer in there to keep it in its system, you know, to keep as much ice in the ratio as what it thinks you're supposed to. But at that point, it says at least you can keep that for like five days. If you keep the lid shut like you're talking about, it's it's sealed in there really well. So you can keep that for a long time. It's not often something I've run into as needing. Mm-hmm. But well, I that's do... oh god, oh that no! I was just saying, I I I find they work fantastic. I mean, we use them on the river, 
and I mean they're they're great for keeping ice, but I mean using them as a cooler that you need to get in and out of, and that's where you lose that uh, so much of your cold air and stuff is opening sure. those lids all the time. Yeah, and so it kind of doesn't really matter whether or not you've got a Yeti or a Coleman or whatever it is. It's when you're in and out of them, you lose the ice. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I see it. And that's just kind of what it boils down to. So in that case, I'd prefer to have something with a little bit more area to actually keep food and stuff in. Yeah, no, the the Yeti one that you see, like maybe at our, yeah, that was a pretty tiny one. Have you seen the big ones? Like, or well, probably the stuff that you guys would have. I figured it would be the same, yeah, same size the, coolers. We have the really large Yetis. That we yeah, have with. and I've seen the stuff that goes on like the commercial fishing boats. Like the uh-huh. just like these huge well, like I mean like sea seafaring boats, like these giant uh-huh. like bench sized yeti coolers that they build into the side of this thing that they're supposed to throw in fresh caught fish. But it's not they make them cost, huge. Man, that's got to be expensive. Oh yeah, it's got to be an insane custom order of like five thousand dollars. I mean, I guess yeah. at that point it's just like, well, yeah, we'll make whatever cooler you want. <laughs> you know, it's just like yeah. plastic and styrofoam at some point. So exactly, there's another company. There's like this other company called Arctic. Like yeah. I think it's R T I C, and they do knockoff Yeti coolers. They like I don't know, drop ship them from China, something like that. But they're like they're like maybe a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars cheaper than the Yeti cooler price. So it kind of brings I've them, heard of them. It brings them back in that range of like a Coleman cooler or like something else that's uh, you know more reasonable. Well, yeah, and that's that's the thing, man. You start pricing coolers out, and it doesn't really matter what level of cooler you want to get. Honestly, sure. I mean, for anything decent, you're looking around a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, it's really you know? true. Yeah, and, and I mean that's that's just kind of like uh, you know, your average. Yeah. Decent igloo. Cool. I mean, with the yeah, with the snaps on the side that you take to the to the tailgate. Well, you can get those guys for like thirty nine bucks or that. something, know. you know. But <laughs> yeah. it's like, but if you get into like a steel belted cooler or anything that actually is yeah. supposed to function correctly right. when yeah. you're out on a trip, um, yeah, I mean, you're kind of looking at a minimum of a hundred bucks. I'd figure that's that's definitely true yeah man yeah that's what that's that's a nuts thing too is like how much money you can you can invest in your equipment like that well <laughs> probably we're talking about that that boat you know getting a custom yeti cooler it's five grand <laughs> yeah jeez so, i know but yeah man i don't know do you have any other uh, stuff to bring up on this i'm sure we're going to talk way more in the future about uh like hiking equipment back in well equipment, I, so. I did i did want to touch on you um aside yeah. from like your basics like a water filter your freeze-dried foods things like that uh what are some things that you bring in your pack um not on a car trip but on a backpacking trip that the you know just just the important things aside from the the obvious oh yeah that's a good question so i mean i know um i try and keep my pack under 40 pounds is what oh, I've done. Each, yeah, each of the okay. times. Uh, well, yeah, I, I really try to keep it um, pretty light, which I guess a little bit what we're talking about. I don't know what to bring at a point. I got my tent, uh, uh-huh. which is a is just a couple pounds. Um, I got like the the stove. You know the the uh-huh. I got uh, let's say like uh, three of those, or you know like a handful of backpacker meals and some Cliff bars. Uh-huh. I've got a way to start a fire. I've got yeah. I've got like my iPod or, so, or, you know, like my phone or something like that charged up. Yeah. And so I'm trying to think of the other stuff. I mean, it's probably clothes that I bring. That's always been the spot where I bring more weight than I need to. Cause it's always like some kind of like, I don't know, it's just like cotton t-shirts or another pair of jeans or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh man. And the worst one is like another pair of shoes. That's been the truth. Oh. I mean, cause you, I want that. Like, uh-huh. like at least like a pair of boots and then like a pair of, of like river sandals. Like there's always yeah. been a situation where I want that. I don't know if that's been for you. Like when the, honestly, when that's that's been huge for me. I did that on a king strip. You know, bring sandals. I mean, if even if you're not getting into the water, it's just nice to let your feet breathe and uh, and just give your feet some type of different support than the hiking boot that you just put 20 miles on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I noticed a a ton that yeah, I really needed to switch back and forth between the two. But I was always frustrated because you got to like store the other pair of shoes somewhere. <laughs> yeah which isn't that much weight it's fine but they're always kind of an awkward sort of bulky size i was trying to think of other stuff see like when i go out or i think i was, I was i'm looking up at a picture from the Wallawas, and i was thinking back to that trip of like special things that i brought or like different things and what yeah. i would i think like we talked about last time i always bring the camera bag with me so there's the, there's the backpack of whatever yeah. it is but then like around the front there's like the camera bag 
with a couple lenses and that's just all glass so there's really no economy of weight going on there yeah and uh and yeah there's other, like a tripod which is like metal legs and stuff you don't need to be carrying it but it's just like mm. a lot of weight that you have to like heave up the, to the top of the mountain the other thing though that i was going to say that i brought was like a keyboard this is a nuts thing probably in your mind yeah yeah but, you're losing me here go ahead and explain yeah i brought a keyboard that i connected to my phone and like to my okay. ipad so that i could do oh. some of the like editing stuff that i was trying to do at yeah. the time which was silly and I, I probably wouldn't do it again if but you guys were doing a lot to. of editing and stuff and and a lot of journaling when you guys were out there it was what we were trying to do, yeah. So it was a lot of like, yeah. it was a lot of stuff. It was a weird job where you go like out in the woods and you take a bunch of photos and you try and like file and write about the photos while while you're there. And I yeah. like this kind of thing. You see it on Instagram every once in a while, like these uh, these cool tent offices. You know, it's somewhere out in the backcountry and it's someone uh -huh. you know hanging out in the in the in the tent with the window open out to wherever, and they've just got their uh, their like iPad or their their MacBook or something like that in the tent on top of the sleeping bags as they're working through and editing whatever. But you kind of think about like how light some of these things are and you can haul them up there and work with them pretty easily now. But the problem is yeah. it's power. So that was the thing about like a MacBook or a laptop. I couldn't support that. I couldn't power it up there. But what I did yeah. do, and I think your dad turned me onto this for the first time. It was that uh -huh. goal zero solar panel kit. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. He I don't know if you- yeah, uh, so I bought one of those that was just like that, and I use that thing a ton on those backpacking trips. How used... did that work out for you? Yeah, I it was the first time I had been using solar power, and really the only thing that it does it's like two panels, maybe about about the size of your you know your two open palms or something like you know it's like the size of like a good book, uh, uh -huh. and so it's really not very big at all for like solar energy, and all that it produces is enough to run out to a, a USB charger, so you can charge your phone. And that was really what I was going for. Um, so it was cool that you could just be out for a week or indefinitely if you wanted, and you could keep your phone or your iPod on. And you know when you turn it into airplane mode, the battery lasts for really quite a long time. So oh, we used, yeah. So yeah, so we used that. We had a couple apps on it that we were using that don't have to connect to anything. But so you uh -huh. can use that to, to file stuff or to write stuff or to record video yeah. or to do whatever else. And, uh, and so we could do that as much as we wanted to and then just recharge it the next day and yeah. put it out in the sunlight on the solar panel it was cool that's great yeah we when we did joshua tree um i was taking like a photo journal or sorry a video journal of the whole the whole trip and uh that was eating up a lot of battery and i was you totally, know I always, yeah. I always use airplane mode for that um just to save that battery but um, we took with us a little charging station, which is actually kind of cool on those road trips. Um, it has enough amperage to actually jumpstart your vehicle. Yeah, um, I've got one of those. And then, yeah, you've got, you know, you got USB ports and stuff like that in there. And uh, I think those, those are, are really useful. Yeah. Yeah, super great. I mean, because honestly, sometimes you get out there and it's just like, man, if you woke up with a dead battery and you're just 15 miles from anywhere, Oh, oh yeah, see another person. It's been a huge concern you know? about it a number of times. Yeah, and with the way vehicles are going anymore, everything's an automatic, so it's not like you're going to compression start your rig out there. Sure. Yeah. 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 It was it was scary. I remember there was a couple times I was driving around that old Camry, man. You remember that? Like that was not that was not always a reliable car, especially that was the best car. It was <laughs> it was the best car, uh, <laughs> but uh, I remember there was a hand, like it had this problem. You know, if you left it in an accessory or with whatever that your lights could be on mode was it would, uh -huh. it would kill the battery in like a half hour or less. Like if you, if you <laughs> left, if you just left it on accidentally or, you know, the, the stereo was on while you were away or the door was open or something like that, it would, it would kill the battery. <laughs> it was like while a, you walk into the gas station. It's just <laughs> yeah. I mean, it probably, it probably could do that. It did that. In fact, a number of times, Oh man, little things you had to deal man. with. Man. Uh, but I, so I how remember, many how many thousands of miles did you put on that car? When I sold it, when I bought it, it was two hundred and fifty thousand miles, which is a lot uh, to buy a car. Just a, just a spring chicken at that point. Just a smooth quarter million. <laughs> and then when I sold it, I sold it for the same price I bought it, and that was with three hundred and sixty-seven thousand miles on it. 
yeah, you're the only person I've known that made money on a vehicle that <laughs> <laughs> you just put a hundred thousand miles on it and made money off of it. <laughs> that, that car Camry, paid man. you to drive it. That Camry. That was great. No, that was it was a cool car. It was a blast. And uh, for yeah, as basic of a little sedan as it was, it really did a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah, it was it was really fun. But it was scary though. Yeah, sometimes I remember being at this campsite uh, where like the battery. I think died. Unfortunately, I think there was someone around that helped us like jump it right then. But mm-hmm. yeah, there was always like something about that in my mind. And I think the next trip that we went and I did have one of those jumper kits in the car and it, yeah. worked, it worked pretty well most of the time. I would recommend, I think like you were talking about earlier of, um, of um, what'd you say? Like keeping up with and maintaining your equipment, man, maintain that charger. Cause it, <laughs> you got to keep that thing yeah. charged kind of, in the wheelhouse of the same season that you might use it in because it does kind of lose it after a little while. Like I had one and like, you know what? I don't know that next winter after it went from a hundred degrees out to freezing out, that battery is toast and it's not really going to give you the amps you need to, to jump your car. I think I ran into that one time. Yeah. <laughs> or I don't know. I, I did what I drained it on, uh, on charging my cell phone or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> oh God. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's uh, that's one thing I can say, and especially as like I don't know for me anyway, as I get into better equipment, um, I'm more motivated to uh, take care of it. Oh yeah, um, and really maintain it. Um, you know, when you're starting in your in your teens and whatever, you kind of just oh, you know, thirty just thirty dollars sleeping bag, not a big deal or whatever. And then you know, you just ruin things. I burn through un- a few unintentionally. Of those. Well, but, yeah, and man, those things they they don't hold up the same way. In a certain no, capacity, don't. it's like that's, I think, a, a good bit of why they've been replaced over time is I burned through a couple $30 sleeping bags in, you know, yeah. a season or two. And the, the zippers are twisted and split, and you go, oh, what? What's going on? Or, I don't know, stuff with the tent, stuff with stoves, stuff with filters. It's yeah, like, and, and honestly, when it comes to outdoor recreational equipment, um, you really do, you just get what you pay for. Oh, yeah, um, that's really true. Man, I... I I just got to that point where it was like, do I want to buy the $30 sleeping bag three times or do I want to buy the $120 sleeping bag once? Yeah. And, you know, and that's just what it came down to. And so I started getting a little more uh, picky when it came to choosing my equipment. I've been trying to be. But, yeah. And there's a there's a range of equipment. There's some equipment. Uh, like you're talking about, I want to be specific. I want to get the good stuff. I want it to work. And then there's an, another class of it. I don't. It's kind of. I don't know if I've really honed it down well, but I almost want it to be as cheap as possible because it's so likely to break or likely to get lost. Yeah. I don't know what that is totally yet, but, but I'm not, <laughs> I know there's like a handful of things that I've gone out. I, for unfortunately for me, it's sometimes like well, it's not always pocket nice, but it's it's like some sunglasses. Sunglasses are a perfect one. Travel sunglasses yep, for me. Exactly. River sunglasses, I go for the cheapest ones. If they blow off my head and you know, in a in water or whatever, there's nothing gone. I don't care. It's fine. Yep, I don't want the best gear. And unfortunately, the only way to come to that conclusion is to live through that situation multiple times the hard way. <laughs> Man, I've like, lost, yeah, I've lost some stuff that it wasn't super valuable, but it was just like, oh, it's just at the bottom of the river now. For yeah, no you know, when oh. you're still like, even if it wasn't really expensive, you're still like, well, that was twenty bucks. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't have it anymore. Yeah, it's it's a bummer. Yeah. So there's a there's a handful of those things that have that. Oh, this is probably just gonna get damaged and get bro- blown out. Whatever that is, I'm trying yeah. to like cut down on on a few of those things. But but yeah, I think that I remember the 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 time I learned that was the sleeping mats. You're talking about your sleeping bag. I've learned it so many times from a sleeping mat of not investing enough in that every night. At like two or three, the hour and a half after I finally fallen asleep after blowing up my my bad excuse for for a little camping mat, about two hours after that, I always wake up in the sleeping bag, kind of on the rocks under the tent. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no, <laughs> you're I know just exactly. like, oh, it's that like thing where you're still asleep and coming into waking when you know you just have a rock in your kidney, and you're thinking, man, no. if only I spent fifteen man. more dollars on this mat. You know what I? I disagree with you there. Um, <laughs> I, like, uh, I've spent good money oh, for several real? times on sleeping uh, mats. It doesn't get better. No. You know what? I got to the point. Like, so, well, 
first off, when I'm when I'm backpacking, I just got to the point where like I'm probably gonna be uncomfortable no matter what. Sure. Yeah. Um, I uh, yeah, I've been there. But man, I was just like, I'm going to use the cot and use as little of the sleeping pad as I can because I have had nothing but bad experiences with sleeping pads. Uh, they always seem to they last a trip or two and then they've got a hole in them. You got to patch them or they just don't seem to hold air. I don't know, man. I mean, I guess you could you could get into some I've seen them, you know, they're $200 sleeping pads. The um, one I got, I got it I got a Thermarest, like a like an un, or one that didn't have a lining on it. Some of them like the REI one you get, it's got this nylon lining that makes it a little tougher. This one was just sort of the the rubbery inside lining of that. But okay, I had one yeah. of those. It was, I think, less than $50. That's the one that I, I still have. It packs down to almost okay. nothing. It's kind of cool. I don't, I've never thrown it down like on the rocks, as it were, or, you know, something like that. So it's always had like a tarp or some kind of lining under it and the ground. But I've slept, I mean, I don't know, not to say that it's been inflated all these nights, but I probably put about 250, 300 nights on that, on that mat over the yeah. last handful of years. <laughs> and, and it's been working out pretty well for you? No, it's like, it was, it was deflated maybe, maybe three or four weeks after I got it. But it's like oh, that geez. thing where you gotta, you gotta like, uh, it's just sort of, you come to this point where you're like, oh no, I just wake up at 2.15 and at 4.10 and it's 6.35 <laughs> and I just reinflate the mat and then I go back to bed. It just becomes part of your nightly routine. Yeah, it's just, uh, <laughs> it's just what you do. Yeah. It's just like getting up to take a leak. Except, yeah. Uh, up the old air mat. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's on the same schedule. It's like a, it's like auto timing. When when do I need to take, get up? And, but yeah, it's, it was it's it's been silly. Yeah, I got that's on the list for this year for 2017. I'm gonna try and get a new mat. Good. <laughs> that's what I'm gonna try. That, that's what you gotta do, man. Figure out what's important. It's like yeah, every year you try to buy like two things that will make your camping experience much better. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen people mess around with those uh those like. It's not foil, but it's, or it's just like a dense foam mat that sort of collapses yeah. down into a little block. I've seen that like strapped to some backpackers uh, uh, kits before, but it was just sort of like this light foam mat that, that crunched down into a little, a little deck. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It was weird. I've not, I've never really used anything like that, but I bet it probably works really well for them. Yeah. I, I've kind of been curious about those. And the other one I've heard uh, good reviews on, and this is from some people that I backpacked with that had one, but it's like, it's, it kind of contours your body in a way that it kind of holds you inside the mat. It's inflatable, but it's got this kind of like uh it's almost the same shape as your mummy bag, but the sides sure. kind of like protrude upward to keep you in it. Oh. Um, because I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you know, man. You get the lightweight sleeping pads and stuff, and you find out really quickly that you just roll off of them in the middle of the night. Yeah. Or whatever. You know, it's just like they're hard to stay on. And I mean, yeah. Like, I'm not a large individual by any stretch of the imagination. And like, they're narrow, though. They're like, they're thin. Yeah. They're super narrow and thin. And uh, yeah, I, I guess. This guy, Jimmy, that I was backpacking with was telling me that uh, he loved it. And I forget the name of the producer. Um, but anyway, yeah, I guess it was really great. That's sweet, man. He's, I got to yeah, look that up. I'm, I'm way, I'm probably way undereducated to really get in deep about like a lot of the different gear, the different manufacturers of outdoor gear. You know what yeah. I mean? Like that, uh, that catalog of REI equipment is sort of swimming around in my mind. But I can't really pin down it like a ton of different things. I'd be like, oh, what about this, Robert? What about this? Ooh, have you talked okay. about the feather down? Bring it. I don't I don't have anything, really. I don't know. I think we've probably talked about a lot of it. Man, I'm a basics kind of person. I don't really care if it's like North Face or Patagonia or Acer Tech or Marmot or something like that. You know, it's not yeah. really like super important. And I know you're kind of like, I mean, most of my gear, most of my layers are from Goodwill. That's, yeah. And they're old too, man. And actually, that's one of the best pieces of advice I might, I might give to anyone who's bothered to listen to this point deep in our podcast, which thank you, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but it's nuts though. Like it's, it's one of the best values that you can get for outdoor equipment was cruising through and having a really specific, clear agenda of the, of the types of things you want to get out of Goodwill. Depends on your area. And you got to go, like I did it in Corvallis. Man, Corvallis yeah. was a gold mine 
for hey don't be giving away all the hot tips the the corvallis goodwill i pulled out i pulled like a great uh north face fleece out that fit me yeah it was per it was eight dollars boom there you go marina got me this uh this marmot shell this blue marmot shell for like less than 12 bucks it was awesome that's like a 200 yeah. jacket i replaced it with a new one and it was it was like 200 bucks at rei it was, a, Man, it was they, the real they're deal. so expensive even like yeah i i mean yeah you're getting quality but man there's got to be some point where it's just like ah it's too much money yeah i like i go in there and i'll shop the like the clearance rack with my gift card that i get for like a birthday or something <laughs> <laughs> you know oh yeah and uh but you're still like wow this is a 60 dollar flannel oh, or yeah. something some of that stuff like, i don't see the value in some of it like we were talking about there's like good things and bad things man i went big on a, a rain jacket i'm at work outside all the time you well, like you you went big on like the boots that you had for um for firefighting yeah. season and like so, there's like sometimes it's like oh that's i need that i need to exactly. have that thing a lot of the time maybe you don't need a new one of those you know or whatever whatever it might be but man, I, I go big on rain gear yeah that's what rain i gear is big i put my money in having uh in having a good thermal layer and i got a, a pretty expensive but like a nicer uh rain jacket like a gore-tex rain jacket to go over it and man that thing has saved me like being out here in oregon i don't need really any other layers other than that and i've noticed that like you can go from like snow to warm weather to like really intense rain and you can pretty much keep that same like set of layers going that whole time and it worked well like yeah. all the time but it's rad when you finally like get something that's like oh this is like this is what i need this is good enough well, to answer for all these different situations at the end. And that's what, yeah, I won't go light on, on anything that keeps you warm and dry. Um, oh, sure. Yeah. First off, I don't even know if there's a really good way around going, you know, going, getting around the expensive stuff on that. Oh yeah. It all seems to be pretty <laughs> steep no matter where you go. But yeah, like, I mean, when it's hot, you can always shed layers. Like you can always remove clothing. Sure. And yeah. get cooler, but when it comes to being cold and wet, um, man, that that's the difference between a good trip and a bad trip, or yeah, absolutely, a good trip and a serious situation. It's changed my experience a ton. I mean, just just kind of working outside a good bit through the day, like even yeah. the day coming through with like uh, there's some snow on the on the hills, like a little bit higher up in the elevation, right on the valley floor. It's nothing, but it's it's pretty lousy winter weather it seems like right now <laughs> oh, but it's man. like it's just waves of rain like every 45 minutes or so it's like 45 minutes on 45 maybe 10 20 30 minutes off then back on to just kind of this drizzle this light rain drizzle that's coming down all the time and if it weren't for the like the whole head cover hood and and gore-tex uh like outfit i've got on i'd be soaked all the time oh man yeah and, like, shoes Shoes are a huge one. Like uh, we should talk about hiking shoes sometime. Like, cause we you've should. had like, uh, well, what's it? What's the 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 boot that you go for a lot? Mine are the uh, the Merrell. Yeah, the the Merrells. Yeah, yeah, I like those. Man, I I've never had Merrells, but they seem pretty Man, cool. They're a great boot. Uh, they're God. You know what? Honestly, when you price shoes, shoes are expensive. They no are expensive. What yeah. you're looking for, honestly. So I'm not even gonna say these are expensive. I, I mean, understand. they're in the hundred and fifty dollar yeah. range. Yeah, but same as a pair of go... Jordans. Yeah, exactly. Same as a pair it's of Yeezys. Like... Way less. <laughs> Way less than Yeezys. Uh, yeah, no, they're great boots, man. I I love them. They're the mid top, but we'll save that for another podcast. Oh yeah, here you. Um, but hey, um, so you know, we always talk a lot about um electronics in the field and things like that, um in different ways that you take your stuff out there. And that's because you are a photographer, Billy. And Thanks, Robert. you take great photos. So um, for anybody listening, if you want to check out Billy's photography, I believe what? It's billynewmanphoto.com. Dot com. You got it right, man. I appreciate All it. All right. Yeah. yeah. So check out go some check it out. Photos. Check out this podcast there. It's, uh, it's hosted on that site if you want to check it out. And uh, yeah, the Get Out There podcast. The feed is up and going. We've got... Uh, information about that at billynewmanphoto.com you can check it out on itunes that's what i recommend if you're hearing this you probably already figured out how to get into the podcast app and look for this but if you are 
give us a review or rate it or uh, subscribe to the podcast. It helps us out a lot in the first eight weeks if we can ramp yeah. up those numbers. <laughs> We're going big time with this one, Robert. <laughs> Absolutely. How many, <laughs> how many people do we have? Probably three, and then two of them are you and I. It's probably, <laughs> it's probably you and me and our girlfriends, respectively. <laughs> But, uh, yeah. it's, uh, but, but we have passed, and this is great news, and it's under a week, and we're under five episodes. In total, we've had 100 downloads. Whoa. Which is big time. It's, again, mostly me and you. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, uh, I think it's like, uh, yeah, we're, we've got uh, around 11 listeners a show. <laughs> no, maybe some like that. No, man. Uh, hey. It's all... It's all, uh, it's all ephemeral at this stage. You can't really tell for a long time. But, uh, no. but overall, though, man, it's really fun. I dig doing a podcast with you, even if, if it's zero people that, uh, that are listening to it. It's still been a blast. Yeah, yeah man. But you're smart. But hey, you know about the outdoor stuff, man. You're good at to well, uh, talk to you about this stuff. No, it's, it's great. I love, I love picking your brain, too, because you've spent, I mean, just as much time as anybody I know doing various types of camping um yeah it's, so it's it's, it's good i like i like speaking with like-minded people about these topics it's cool man it's cool but hey um sounds like we might have a trip planned for this weekend um we don't know oh what, yeah entirely what it is yet but we got some things in the works maybe we'll do a do a little podcast from wherever we are we got to do one yeah if we if we meet up in person we'll definitely do a live podcast it'd be cool <laughs> absolutely so hey for uh those 11 listeners out there you guys stay tuned. We got a little something for you. <laughs> That's going to be a special treat. Episode That's six right. coming up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just like, hey, we hung out today. There you go. No, but we'll, uh, we'll put it together. It'll be fun. It'll be cool. But yeah, Robert, thank you very much for doing this podcast tonight. Yeah, thank you, Billy. It's been good. I appreciate it, man. So on behalf of Robert Biscaret, my name is Billy Newman, and thank you guys very much for listening to this episode of the Get Out There podcast.